Hi there, this is Solitude Ronan from Solitude Ronan Films and welcome to another random review. Today's random review is from 1965 and it's The Pawnbroker starring Rod Steiger directed by Sidney Lumet. This is the BFI, Blu-ray and DVD release that came out a few weeks ago. It's a dual disc and it has a rather nice booklet which has um, a piece on Quincy Jones who did the music it has um, a little piece on Sidney Lumet and it has an overall look and essay on the film itself um, it is stacked with extras. It has a commentary by Maura Spiegel, author of Sidney Lumet, A Life. Um, and Arnett Insdorf, author of Indelible Shadows, Film and the Holocaust. There's a 21 minute interview with Quincy Jones from 1968. And there is a Guardian audio interview with Rod Steiger, which is 113 minutes. And then there's also 10 Bob and Winter from 1963, a 12-minute film um, about the intriguing social dynamics that arises a 10-shilling note is passed around the black community um, featuring a jazz soundtrack by the Joe Harriet Quintet. The print looks really nice. It's shot in black and white. It's really crisp um, and a really nice print. I would highly recommend it. Um, the film itself is based on a novel and it's about a pawnbroker, spoiler alert. Um, a German Jewish gentleman, played by Rod Steiger, who has a pawnbroker shop in Harlem. And he has pretty much shut himself off from life. He's a survivor of the concentration camps. And he has survivor's guilt. And he doesn't want anything to do with people or life. His sole um, reason for carrying on is money and providing for his family and a wife of his friend who didn't make it out of the concentration camp. Um, the film starts with this slow motion, idyllic country scene next to the river, something out of a Renoir film. Um, Rod Steiger, much younger, with hair, um, playing with his children, but then Quincy Jones throws in some atonal foreboding music, and then we cut to Rod Steiger as an elderly gentleman with less hair um, on a sound a sun a sound a sun lounger um, in the back garden um, of his family his relatives um, which are obviously upstate out of New York so we have an idyllic past and then we seem to have this idyllic present but then we cut to him in Harlem, which is much noisier and much more um, confrontational in his shop and we're introduced to regular customers that come in pawning items. Um, this is a film that has so many characters that could have a film of their own. So even though this is a film about one man, a solitary man. It's obvious that you have to have other characters with their own stories, because otherwise you just have a man who doesn't talk to anybody and just doesn't speak. Um, 
which would be, some would argue, an interesting film in itself. But we have his younger assistant, um, played by Jamie Sanchez, who wants to better himself. He wants Rod Steiger to teach him about gold, how to detect whether things are fake or real. Um, he is trying to teach his mother English. So you have his story. Um, we have a man who essentially just comes into the shop to talk. You know, as with city life, there's lots of people that are disconnected and disenfranchised and sometimes just want somebody to talk to. Of course, Rod Steiger's character is pretty abrasive and again, he doesn't want to feel anything, he doesn't want to know anybody, he doesn't want to speak to anybody. Um, and it just speaks to Rod Steiger's performance that you're still interested in this character because he's not a particularly um, engaging person to other people. Um, you have um, this woman who runs a youth um, kind of club in the local area who tries to get money from Steiger, perhaps um, have him a sponsor of one of the youth teams and of course he's not interested but she herself has been through um, personal tragedy and she tries to connect with him, tries to take him out for lunch which is a wonderful scene as they move about park benches as Rod Steiger um, sets her straight and um, her beliefs and what she thinks that um, a hard life is. Um, so we have her character, we have the local gangster boss who is essentially using Rod Steiger's shop as a front for his prostitution and gambling rackets and he taunts Steiger by calling him professor because he used to be a professor in Germany before um, the war. Um, Steiger goes to visit the wife of a friend who didn't make it out of the concentration camp. Um, and like I said, there's lots of guilt, there's lots of survivor guilt. Um, and her brother is bedridden. Um, and I'm assuming, I think he was in the concentration camps as well. And he is always chastising Rod Steiger for basically, you know, having the survivor guilt and shutting everything down. Know, where he thinks you should actually try and live because you did actually get um, your life back. Um, you have the local gang, which the young assistant kind of knows. Um, and once a certain plot device kicks in, um, gets more involved with the gang, which is fronted by the same actor who plays Coffin Ed, or Gravedigger Jones from Cotton Comes to Harlem, arguably my favourite black exploitation film. Um, but I think he plays Coffin Ed. Or he could have played Gravedigger Jones. I can't remember which one Godfrey Cambridge was. I think he was Gravedigger. Um, so it's the actor who plays Coffin Ed, I think, in Cotton Comes to Harlem. He plays the lead of the, the gang. Um, so there's a lot going on in the film, even although its central performance is Rod Steiger, who was nominated for an Oscar. Um, I have to say, you know, I've, I think we've all, every now and again perhaps, um, been a little bit critical of Steiger's performances because he is known to uh, nibble the scenery a little bit from now, from um, now and then. Um, but this might actually be his best performance because it's a much more controlled, dialed down Steiger. Yes, he has outbursts, but they're not Rod Steiger outbursts. They're much more controlled because this is a man who has essentially shut down. Um, so when the outbursts come, it, it's more real. Um, and it is possibly the only Rod Steiger performance that is quite moving. Um, we do get flashbacks to, because there's events in his 
current life or something that's said that gives him flashbacks and um, Lumet does a really good job because they just all drop in a frame um, of the flashback and keep cutting so it's quite it is a confrontational film um, it's provocative the way Quincy Jones score is kind of atonal at times and jarring and then you have these free these frame drop-ins of flashbacks um, and it's not just a frame and then back to um, the modern day and then we see the flashback there's multiple frames that are dropped in um, and it's really an arresting way of doing flashbacks because again the past is literally coming into his head um, and disturbing his bubble that he's created for himself um, as he kind of has to um, face things from his past that like I said he's shut down um, and doesn't want um, in. Obviously in the pawn shop there's the cage and that obviously is similar to the, the cage in the prison and the concentration camp. Um, so there's lots of shots of um, lattice across um, Rod Steiger's face. Um, it's a wonderful film. It's bleak. There's no easy answers. Um, you can see perhaps why it wasn't a box office smash. Um, it's still a challenging film, just the way Lumet has shot it. Um, but it's a film that I would highly recommend checking out if you haven't seen it or if you haven't seen it for a while. And again, the BFI release is wonderful for extras and the print is really excellent. And you're not getting a, a Rod Steiger that is feeling peckish in regards to scenery. It's a much more controlled um don't want to say mature performance by him but it is a kind of a much more controlled um performance um, and i think it is more affecting than quite a lot of his work so thanks very much for watching this random review of the pawnbroker again let me know in the comments whether you've seen it and what you think of it and hopefully you'll join me again for more random reviews. This is Saul Chiron from Saul Chiron Films saying farewell.